Hello and welcome to Witchy Wellness Radio. I'm your host, Lauren Cholantani, women's holistic health coach and fellow recovering perfectionist. This podcast was created to show you that your body is not in the way, it is actually leading your way. Hello, hello, beautiful people. This is your host, Lauren, again, and you are listening to episode 83, Finding Your Fit with Kathleen Trotter. Now, Kathleen is a super motivational and inspirational, happy-go-lucky, motivated soul. It was so wonderful talking with her. Kathleen is a fitness expert, media personality, personal trainer, writer, life coach, and overall health enthusiast. She's the author of Finding Your Fit, A Compassionate Trainer's Guide to Making Fitness a Lifelong Habit, and Your Fittest Future Self, Making Choices Today for a Happier, Healthier, and Fitter Future You. Now, before we jump into today's show, I just wanted to remind you guys that Witchy Wellness Radio is brought to you by Magnesium. Uh, episode 73, Maximizing Your Health with Magnesium with Kristen Bowen. We talk all about the beautiful health, mind, body, and soul benefits magnesium has for you transdermally. Head over to the episode to take a listen. But if you click in the show notes for my link and use code WICHY, W-I-C-T-H-Y, you will get 10% off your offer. Now back to today's show, you'll hear all about Kathleen's transformational story from childhood and how she now empowers other people to do the same. Why our brains are not actually wired to keep us happy. Are we just unmotivated? Are we just emotional hot messes? How life is just a big science experiment. Creating new fitness habits with purpose. Finding your edge without going over it or not overdoing it. AKA don't hurt yourself. Becoming your own fitness hero, COVID in relation to mindset, nutrition, and workouts. Are you shitting all over your workouts? And so, so, so much more. Oh my gosh, such a fun episode with this bright and bubbly soul. Please enjoy episode 83, Finding Your Fit with Kathleen Trotter. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Wishy Wellness Radio. And again, I am your host, Lauren Chalantani, and this is a show you get to learn how your body is not in your way, but actually leading your way. And today, our lovely guest, Kathleen Trotter, is a fitness expert, media personality, personal trainer, writer, life coach, and overall health enthusiast. She's the author of Finding Your Fit, a compassionate trainer's guide to making fitness a lifelong habit and your fittest for fittest future self, making choices today for a happier and healthier, fitter version future of you. And we'll get into more of her bio in a second, but welcome to the show, Kathleen. I'm oh, so excited to have you here. here. I know our conversation pre hitting record. I'm just like, this is going to be the best podcast ever. You and I, I think we're like sisters, you know, like it's great. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I know we're like, what, where do we want to go first? You know, oh, let's go all, 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 of, all of the things. Um, but I would, I would love to hear how you got to be this beautiful, you know, have this self agency in, in your oh. fitness and your health and your mindset and your nutrition, because yeah. I know it it's a hero's journey, right? And it, it continues. Yeah, it is. That's, really, that's my message to everybody. And just that, you know, because the idea of heroes are not born, they're like, they're, they're created through their process, right? That Joseph Campbell arc of, you know, you have to depart and then you go through all this road of trials and then you come back sort of that healthier, fitter, more resilient version of you. And that's why I love this idea of the hero's journey, because it's like, I've had to fight my hero's journey. And I'm now I'm so proud of what I've accomplished, but it's not this. I think a lot of people get really discouraged because they think, okay, health is, I decide I'm going to do it. And then I kick ass and then that's who I am. And then I never have to struggle again. And it's like, no, like I struggle every day to find the motivation to do stuff. And, but the thing is, is that, you know, I, I'm able to course crack a little bit faster. I'm able to talk myself 
to myself with kinder words. I have the muscle memory to know that I feel good when I work out. So I'm more likely to do that. You know, I, I have the ways of saying like no caffeine, like you can miss once that's an anomaly, but if you miss twice, that's the start of a new habit, get back on your horse. You know, I have the ability to say like, yeah, you don't want to work out, but future you is going to be so much prouder and happier and healthier and more vibrant if you do. But all of that comes from like years of work and years. I also have to credit my therapist. Like I've been in therapy for 20 years and she's so amazing. I actually have a, a session later today. And she's just like, you know, she's just taught me that it is a process it is a journey. And it's what a wonderful problem of privilege, right? Like the idea of like, oh, I have to work on my health. I'm like, that's, and that's a very big difference. Like I think the first half of my life, I was very unhealthy. I was overweight. I kind of ate my way through my parents' divorce. And this idea of like, you know, you should work out. It was very like, I don't know, it was oppressive. And it just was like, oh, I don't want to. And I was always rebelling against these shoulds from the outside world. And I think what's cool is that gradually, it's a gradual process. I have to like stress that. And I have days where I fall backwards, but gradually what I've learned is that it, it's, it, it's an intrinsic thing that I want to do. And it's something I get to do for myself, right? Like my body is not a garbage can. Why would I want to put garbage food into it? Like, but you know, 20 years ago, I was like, I would hide food from my mom. I would say to my mom, I'm going to walk home from school so I could stop and get fish and chips and like stuff them in my face. And then, um, you know, uh, stop and brush my teeth or do mouthwash. So she wouldn't know. Right. Like, but it's just, it's us being just, it's, you know, it's so much about having grace. And anyway, so the nut of the story is I grew up not overly healthy. I hated exercise. And it was my mother saying to me, Kathleen, you have to find, we have to find, it was we, it was a team. And I think that's a key takeaway when anybody's listening, like, can you get people on your team? Like it takes a village, right? So my mom was my, my first of my team. And she said, you don't like to be active with your, your peers. Cool. Let us find a workout that works for you. Let's meet you where you are. Let's find a solution. Let's, say that daily motion has to be a non-negotiable but how you move is up to you and that's a huge part of my fitness philosophy now so she got me a membership uh, at the ymca and uh, we lived in a small town so the demographic was sort of over 40 and under five and she's like you're going to be okay here because it's there's no one in your peer group you're not going to feel any shame you're not going to feel uncomfortable and so i just went and i literally started walking on the treadmill and then walking on the treadmill for 10 minutes turned into 20 minutes it turned into doing some weights it turned into aerobics classes then i started teaching aerobics classes um, and then i decided i should go to school for kinesiology and then i pilates and then you know and then eventually i did like a master's in exercise science but it started with these really small little winds that spiraled that kind of snowballed upwards and it's really started with me meeting me where I was having somebody that really supported me and finding my version of fit and my fitness personality now that can change right like at the beginning this 10 minutes was perfect and like then I ran marathons and then I did Ironmans and so it can evolve and it can change um, but James Clear has this saying, and he says that you have to standardize the habit before you can optimize. And I think a lot of us, we try to optimize before we standardize. So it's like, oh, well, if it's not the best workout, like what's the point of doing it? If it's not an hour workout, what's the point of doing it? If it's not the best food. And it's like, well, no, like start with 10 minutes, 10 minutes can turn into 20, but if you don't do 10, like then you're just doing zero. Um, anyway, so that's sort of, that's the nutshell of me. And I don't know, gradually I've just sort of let go of a lot of the shame and the hate in myself and really started to learn about how good I feel when I move and how good I feel when I eat the, you know, foods that serve me and sleep well. And, you know, I have days that I fall off my horse for sure. I have moments and, but you know, you course correct faster and, and you just learn to talk to yourself in a way that sort of serves you, I guess. Um, and you have people on your team that are like, you know what, you can do it. And slowly, I don't know, there's a scene in the first Wonder Woman movie where, Diana's aunt says something to Diana like everybody else knows how strong you are but you need to know it and you know gradually through that movie she turns from that little girl it mim mimicking like women fighting um into this like unbelievably strong woman who knows her worth and that's what I feel like I want all that for my clients like I want when they first come to see me I'm like I know you can do it but I was like I know I need you to know you can do it and slowly little by little little acts of self-trust you know they do a little bit of a walk they do some weights they do some flight and they're like I can't do this oh I feel good oh and then it's like then you want to feel those feelings more right but that's the sort of I don't know if anybody's listening and I hope some of this resonates. And if you're thinking like, oh, but I will never be, or I could never do, or I, it's like, screw that. Of course you can. But in order to create a fitter future, you, you have to act today. Like that's, I think if there's one message, I would just sort of say, like, don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Like, this is the only moment we have control over. And 
the hero and the coward, they both have the same emotions. They're both afraid. But the difference is the hero is like, yeah, I'm afraid. I'll own that fear, but I'm going to act anyway. Um, and that's that's the truth. Like, I was so afraid 20 years ago. I was so afraid people were going to judge me at the Y. But my mom was like, it's okay. I'll be there. I can I can be there with you. And then slowly I didn't need her anymore, right? Like, how cool is that? I don't know. That was a lot. I just vomited a lot at you. But like, take take, take, what's, what you, take what's useful from there. I mean, it all was useful. I think we all can relate to that. And I have to say, what motivates me for movement is I always tell myself, you know, after I move my body or exercise or workout, because sometimes I call it movement. Sometimes yeah. I don't even want to call it exercise, I right? Exercise. I know for sure, absolutely. And I, I say, you know what? No matter how that looks, I never regret it after yeah. I do it. Yeah. Never. <laughs> this, is, this is a lesson from my therapist that I'm giving to the entire world. Yes. When I first started therapy, she got me to keep a journal. I now call it a mood journal. I do it with my clients, but I totally give her credit. Um, where she said to me, every morning when you wake up, put a number of how you feel. So let's say on a scale of one to 10, you feel like a one. She's like, after you work out, mark down how you feel. And I did that for two weeks. And what was super cool is there was not one day that after I moved my body, whether it was a 10 minute walk or Pilates or yoga, that my number hadn't, even if it was like a 0.1 increase, like 0.1 is pretty, like it's better than zero. And at least you feel like, even if you still feel pretty crappy, at least you feel crappy and proud that you've done something. But there's something about having that data that's really useful because if I don't want to work out, I can actually pull out my old journal and I can be like, oh, interesting. Like I see those numbers, but I don't even need to do that anymore because it's like in my body, I can think, okay, you will literally always feel better if you move. And there's, I don't know that what's that business adage, like what gets measured gets managed. And I feel like there's a little bit of that, like our brains are not very good um, there's this podcast called the happiness lab podcast with Lori Santos. I don't know if you know it, but okay. You're nodding your head. You're like, yeah, I do. So she always says like, you know, our, our brains are not very good at uh, for knowing what's going to make us happy. And I think that that's the thing. It's like, we're wired. Our brains are wired to keep us alive, not healthy and happy and content and all those things. So, you know, we get afraid of things. And then when you're afraid, you don't want to do it. And we get like, And there's so many cognitive distortions that are there to keep us alive. And if you know that they're kind of going on, you can say, okay, interesting. Like, yeah, I'm afraid. And fear is a good thing when appropriate, because if a bus is coming at me, I need to be able to be like, oh my God, a bus is coming. I better get out of the way. But if there's not an actual literal bus, if it's a bus of my fear, my being like, I'm not worthy, that transit and worthiness, then you have to be able to be like, okay, interesting. A bus is coming, not a real bus. How do I prove to myself that I am worthy? I do something worthy of my pride so it's recognizing your emotions but just sort of saying like but I know that my brain is trying to trick me and that's okay like I can know it and then I can take the actions that really do serve me and I'll just give you my favorite cognitive bias because this is I think connects to that idea of the journaling the mood journaling that I said um, it's called uh, present bias so it's basically the idea that our brain thinks that however you feel in this moment is how you're always going to feel now when I say brain I don't mean your conscious mind right I mean your unconscious so you wake up in the morning and you're like oh my god I'm tired I sleep I just want to sleep more and your brain is like well if I'm tired now like I'm always going to be tired so this is where self-talk comes in because you have to say to yourself okay interesting you're tired now but if you work out you will feel better and that's like not going into that present bias. Um, but it works in the other way as well. People in New Year's, January 1st, everyone's like, oh, I'm so motivated. And then you sort of think you're always going to be motivated. But motivation goes like this. So what you have to be able to say to yourself is like, okay, so that's my brain playing tricks on me. I'm not always going to be motivated. I have to create systems in advance that set my future self up for success. So I need to get a fitness buddy or I need to get an accountability buddy or I need to join some type of program online or I need to start food journaling or whatever it's gonna do to help you stay on on your health horse when your motivation's in the toilet, right? Because that's, um, BJ Fogg talks a lot about that, like the wave of motivation, right? And that is like, that's just normal. That's just physiology. Like that doesn't make you a good or a bad person or like, you know, having willpower or be fit or not fit. Like just, this is how motivation goes with everybody. And the trick is, is that I have learned when my motivation's down, how to make myself move. It's not that I'm always motivated. Like I think people think like, oh, the healthy people, they're always motivated. I'm not always motivated. Well, I'm destined to be unfit. It's like, no, we're all like, we're all emotional messes. It's just like, how well do you manage your emotional mess, right? I don't like, well, how do you like, how would you, if you're in the motivational low pit, like what systems do you have that you've implemented that help you move? Or like, what do you do? What do I do? Um, 
I definitely can relate in the morning. You know, oh, what's I, like, I don't want to wake up. I love my bed. It's so warm. And, you know, I my body naturally wakes up. Our alarm goes up at five. I naturally wakes up before five. Just, wow. you know, I'm awake, but I don't want to get out of bed. So for me, what I do is sometimes I just do like a simple box breath. Like this morning, that's literally what I did because I was like, okay, come on, Lauren, like get up and, you know, have a dance. Sometimes having a dance party first thing in the morning really helps me to get out of bed. Cause I love, I love to like I move it in the morning. <laughs> we are sisters. Okay. But here are my two systems for the, for the morning. And I think, oh my God, that's so funny. You and I are so the same. So I set my alarm across the room. Yes, I that too. My alarm to Britney Spears, who is my dirty little secret. I love Britney Spears. So by the time I get from my bed to across the room, I can't help doing a little like, I'm like dancing to Britney. I'm like, work it, bitch. Like, uh, or maybe you have to bleep that out. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm like dancing. And then I get to the alarm and I'm like, oh, I'm already awake. I'm already up. And then here's my second system. <laughs> the people at home are like, oh my God, Kathleen's crazy. I sleep in my exercise clothes. So I get out of bed. The alarm's across the room. I'm like dancing, move my butt. And then I get to the alarm. I turn it off and I'm like, I look down and I'm wearing my exercise clothes. I'm like, oh my God, if you go back to bed now, like that is super lame. So then I just go and I work out. But I've had to, but like, I don't know about you, but that system took me years of like, my alarm goes off and then I roll over. And then, and like, I've tried so many different things. Like, you know, I've tried the Mel Robbins, like five, four, three, two, one, just do it kind of idea just wasn't enough. I tried the idea of Tom Billy who talks about like, he's only allowed to sleep in, like once his alarm goes off, there's 10 minutes until he can get out of bed. And like, that's like really big thing. Like I've tried all this stuff and it just, none of it worked for me. Um, but I think the thing is, is what I've really tried to embrace is that nothing is a failure. It's just a learning opportunity. So if you try something, it's like life's this like ginormous um, science experiment. And if you do a science experiment and you get a negative result, that's not bad. That's actually like you learn a lot from that negative, right? So I think I try to tell my clients, like if you try something and it doesn't work, cool. Then you now know that doesn't work. So I know that pretending to be Mel Robbins or Tim um, Tom Bilyeu, it like doesn't work for me. I'm not those people. But what does work for me is some Britney Spears, right? So it's like, okay, like, you know, it took like 20 years, but finally I've figured it out. <laughs> Most days anyway. Um <laughs> But it's a process, you know, and like, I hope that while people are listening to this, they're like, oh, interesting. What works for me? What doesn't work for me? What have I tried? What are some bright spots that are in my past that I could call on, right? Like, you know, if you 10 years ago joined Weight Watchers and it really worked for you, like maybe something, not necessarily Weight Watchers, but maybe something where you have a group support is really useful or somewhere that you have to track your food. Or maybe, you know, if you've tried some type of tracking app and you're like, oh, this really works. Like maybe you want to try Noom or My Fitness Pal or like just... I don't know, like noodle on what has worked and what hasn't and who are you? And then try to meet yourself where you are. Like it, it's so, it doesn't make any sense to try to be somewhere else, like you, someone else. Like you got to thrive in your own lane, right? And I don't know, I like to tell my clients, like, why do you try to be a second rate version of somebody else when you can be a first rate version of yourself? It's this weird form of self-aggression that we're all like, I got to be a whole new me. I'm like, I got a new person. It's like, just be you, but like move more and eat better food and like love yourself. Like it's just... I don't know. You don't have to, I don't know. It's just, I don't know. I, 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 I hope that slowly the fitness discourse is changing. And I think that podcasts like yours and people yeah. like me, you know, is changing the messaging. Like it's not about being your favorite celebrity or even being like your mom or your dad or your best friend. It's like about being a version of you that serves you. 100%. And I think, and I, I struggle with this still at times. Um, I love yoga. That's how my partner, David, and I met through yoga, um, which is so sweet. But it's like sometimes you get in those group fitness type of situations. You're like, I have to win at yoga. I have, you know, I have to be able to do the advanced versions of everything and jump back and inversions. And it's like, girlfriend, you're missing the entire point. You're here to do yoga. <laughs> You know, and, and just, you have to laugh at yourself. Oh, you've got to laugh at yourself. Okay, so here's my version of that. So the uh, history is, is that I have this right hip injury. About a year and a half ago, I um, damaged my right labrum, which is like the, the portion inside of the hip that gives your hip sort of like congruency and stability. Anyway, it never grows back. It just is about managing it. It's so much better. But one of the things that I don't do is join a lot of like external competitions. Like, so I have a Peloton, which I love, but I very much try to keep, 
it connected to what I've done in the past and where I want to go. I don't, I actually don't have friends on the Peloton because I just don't like the idea of like, you know, what are they doing? What am I doing? Anyway, about a month ago, maybe one of my friends, he was like, can I be your friend on Peloton? And I was like, going to say no. And then I was like, whatever, like, you know, it's whatever. One person's not a big deal. Okay. So I am friends with one person, which is him, but he's friends with like 18 people. So he started to get in the habit of texting me a screenshot of all of the people on his list and being like, Kathleen, you're number one. And like, I'm number two and I want to beat you and like all this stuff. I started working so much harder on that stupid Peloton and I would be on the Peloton and be like, Kathleen, don't do it. Your hip, you are not there yet. Like your hip is very recovered, but it's not there yet. And I pushed and I pushed because of my stupid little ego. And I kept saying like, Kathleen, put that ego to bed. And I didn't, and I didn't. And you know what? I got re-injured and last Wednesday um, I basically had like 48 hours where I could hardly get out of bed because my hip was so injured and I was like okay this is a really 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 good learning opportunity you set up systems because you know yourself you know yourself that you cannot be in those competitions maybe 10 years from now you can but right now you can't and I think that fitness is about knowing yourself it is about knowing who you are in this moment and meeting yourself where you are, not who you want to be. Like, don't meet yourself at your, at your aspirational self. Like my aspirational self could be part of a competition and could just be like, oh, well, who cares? I'm going to do me. My current me cannot do that. It's like, I can't have chocolate in my house because I know that if I have chocolate in my house, do you know what I'm going to do? Eat all of the chocolate, all of the chocolate. And I spent years bringing it home and being like, you know what? You'll just have a little bit of it. Like I love this, these fudge bars. So I'd like bring about a box of fudge bars and they're like, oh, you'll just have one. And then of course I eat all six in one night. So now I've at least learned, I do not bring the fudge bars in the house. If I want one, I'll go to my mom's house. We'll hang out. I'll have a fudge bar there. Like don't deny myself it, but I know that that doesn't serve me. And I don't know, like that's, I think what health and wellness ultimately is, is little by little knowing yourself well enough to say, what are the systems that set my future me and not the aspirational future me, but the real future me, like, what am I going to eat when it's 11 o'clock at night and I'm depressed and angry and sad and frustrated and it's COVID and I want to punch somebody in the face. Like, what am I going to eat? right? It's like, yeah. And what am I, when is the time that I'm not going to want to work out? Okay. Those are the times I need the systems. We don't need systems for when you're really motivated. You don't need systems for two o'clock in the afternoon when you're like, Oh, I don't need that chocolate. You need the systems when you're for tired, when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're the least sort of put together version of yourself. So anybody who's listening, I really urge you, like, think about like, when are the times you fall off the horse? Those are the moments you need to plan for plan for those moments. And Amen. <laughs> if you, get, you become friends with me on social media. Anytime you want to say to myself, say to me, Kathleen, have you joined a stupid competition lately? I, I'm all for you nudging me in the right direction. Because if people ask me that, then I will be much more likely to be like, oh yeah, know yourself, know yourself, know yourself. <laughs> it's accountability coming in again. No, what's that? Yeah. Like, properties, like, what is, is that what he said, like, the, know thyself or whatever. I feel like that's the key. Yeah. I call it gold, the Goldilocks principle with my clients. It's like the understanding, like what's too little, what's too much and what's just mm-hmm. the right amount. Because with everything, like, you know, if you do too little exercise or mo- movement, you don't get stronger, you kind of stagnate. But if you do too much, you get injured and you get frustrated, you get burnt out. So what's that zone of like enough that you challenge yourself and you push yourself out of your comfort level enough that you get stronger, you know, both emotionally and physically and like trying new recipes and all that stuff, but not so much that you're like, oh my God, this is too much. Like I'm, I'm going to read traumatize myself right yeah. so same thing with yoga is that you always say finding your edge or go to your edge yeah. right it's that sweet spot where you know I've done the same thing I have I just have naturally tighter hamstrings I like to run too which I love it. it's a, like meditation yeah. process for me yeah. but doing yoga after running you know things things get tight um yeah. And I've injured my hamstrings. I've injured my glutes because of that. Because it's like, oh, I did it on the other side. Let's let's do the other side. Let's find that edge. And I know it's like, Lauren, you went way past that edge because the other side was better or because you did it yesterday or, you know, it's, so hard. it's about finding that sweet spot, you know, like just like what you said, the Goldilocks. I love that, that analogy. It's beautiful visualization. Because. <laughs> Um, I think the word, I think the term is homesis. No. Um, homeostasis? No, it's not homeostasis. There's a word, it's like a term from like technology. And basically the idea is what's tricky with finding your edge because mm-hmm. the edge and the dose 
is not always the same. So like, for example, if you take exercise, um, that, if, you know, it, it's okay to push yourself really hard one day, as long as you then give yourself like 48 hours to recover. Cause you actually get stronger when you're recovering. The tricky part becomes, at least for me, is like, I can do one hard bike on like hard Peloton where I'm competing against those stupid 18 people one day, but then you need like three days of recovery to get stronger. And I think what happens with the brain that's tricky is that the dose, like one of something is fine, four of something is not. Like the same thing with, with like chocolate, like one chocolate's fine, mm -hmm. but then you can delude yourself and be like, oh, well, I had one chocolate and I, my tummy doesn't feel that bad. Like, so I might as well have 45. And then you're like, oh, now I feel nauseous and I want to vomit. So it's tricky because our brains are not very good with those nuances. And um, so whatever that term is, I think it's homesis, but it, yeah, it's not homeostasis. It's something different. It's, but it's this idea of like, it gets trickier. Like if it was always easy that it was, if it was like, well, if it was like a, like a light switch on or off, right. If it yeah. was like well, one chocolate is bad, zero chocolates are good, but it's not like part of life and part of maturing is understanding the, the portions and understanding that like sometimes actually having a beautifully, wonderfully made, beautiful, dark chocolate with your, like, you know, your partner, it, like, that's very romantic and lovely. Yeah. And it's a wonderful part of life, but you just can't allow yourself to snowball and be like, oh, well, I had one, so I might as well have 10. Or, you know, I stayed up late, you know, watching Netflix, a, a movie, a date night. Like, that's a lovely thing to do once in a while. But if you do that every night and forsake your sleep for 10 nights in a row, you turn into a basket case. So it's, you know, yeah, the dose sort of makes the poison and the frequency and the intensity of that dose really matter. Um, and I think that that's one of the issues with health is it's just, it's, it's lovely. And it's that beautiful problem of privilege of figuring out who you are. But I think that's one of the reasons why so many of those programs are sold of like, you know, the, the sort of cookie cutter programs, because it makes it seem like it's simple. It's like, oh, well, if I do this one thing, then I'll be perfect. Then I'll be healthy. But it's just not as, it's not as simple as that, but it's, you know, it's mm -hmm. hard to sell the complexity of health, I think. Yeah. And what you just said, and I check myself with this all the time. Am I creating this if then happiness? If I have the house, if I have the body, the bank account, the dog, the partner, whatever, then I'll be happy or I'll be worthy, fill in whatever. That, that, that I think that's the difference of finding your edge is like, me getting into this yoga pose, you being number one in Peloton, is that because we think that's going to make us happy? You know, it's, it, it, it's something. It's something you should ponder every single day. Yeah. What's the motivation for doing? Things? Yeah. What's? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's very. It's tricky. So I'm doing right now this 21 day motivation. Uh, sorry, um, meditation challenge with the 10 percent happier podcast app. I don't know if that's something. That if you don't, you would love that. Yeah. And I'm absolutely loving it. And the meditation that we had last night is sort of on this. She was having us meditate on things that you think would make you happy. And if there's ever been moments in your life where you've sort of experienced that and sort of almost if you were, were you happy in that moment? And the truth is, is like, it's so fleeting. So the idea of creating like a calmness, calmness and, and equilibrium that's like a constant and so where I went with this is I definitely suffered with like lots of eating sort of stuff when I was growing up and um so I was thinking sometimes when I'm in a bad place I go to that like oh well if I was x weight I'd be happy and you know this meditation taught me something I thought back to moments in my life where I have been that weight like when I was on like and I was like I was not happy I I was not I was equally as unhappy if not more because I'd gotten to what I wanted and I still wasn't happy and there's almost this like frustration of like if you think oh if I make a million dollars I'll be happy and then you make a million dollars and you're not happy you're like oh crap like what happens now and I think that that's what happened with my when I was in the eating disorder cycle but having that in my pet meditation last night was really useful for exactly what you just said because it was just this revelation of like I've done that before. I've reached things that I thought would make me happy and I felt super empty. So if that's the case, then how do I work on feeling content and fulfilled now? Not content and fulfilled because everything's perfect, but content and fulfilled because I'm on a process, I'm on a journey. And I, that beautiful acceptance of like, I'm here and I'm now and I will do more. But like in this moment, I got, I have everything that I need. And like, I have a wonderful partner and I have a cute little dog. And like, there's so many things to be grateful for in the craziness of all the other things that exist as well. That paradox of life of like, you can 
have two almost conflicting emotions at the same time. Like you can feel content and grateful for what you have while also wishing that so many other things in life, you know, were better. People weren't losing their jobs in COVID and, you know, people weren't dying and all like, but all those things are in addition to having that sense of, you know, gratitude and fulfillment. And but that's a really almost impossible thing. It's like, um, uh, Dan Harris uh, calls it like the slippery fish. It's like that thing you're always trying to get and you can't quite hold on that feeling of like internal, you know? And so, I don't know. I feel like, I don't know. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful problem of privilege to be able to like noodle on all this stuff. Yeah. You know? For me, like I'm really into manifestation mm, as well. Can you tell me a bit about, and, I, and that's my next thing I got to get better into. Yeah. And what you just described actually is a perfect state of being is you're content and grateful for where you are right now in this moment, but still wanting more, right? It's that growth mindset. So it's, you know. Our sisters, like the fact that (laughs) Carol Dweck is like, I am like obsessed with her. And I do this, um, this group coaching. And it's like, that's the, one of the premises of the group coaching is teaching everybody to have a growth mindset about their health. Like that's the hero's mindset. That's like, yeah, everything can be going to crap, but like, yeah. where do I find the learning opportunity in this? Right? Like, oh my God. Yes. She's amazing. Carol Dweck. Oh my, the word yet. Right? Like, I don't know it yet. I haven't mm-hmm. learned how to do that yet. It just gives you such possibility. It's like, yeah, every, like I could be terrible at doing this today, but like, that doesn't mean that tomorrow I'm not going to be better. And all I can do, I have this moment to have control over. And if I can work in this moment, I will be better tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. Have you been, have you had something with your health, like with your fitness? I feel like that's something that people sort of think like, oh, I start running. I'm not very good at it. Well, I should just quit versus like, well, oh. I have to earn the right to be good. Or like, yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's that thing. Like, what have you started that you've been really crappy at that you're now? Oh, I, well, I'll say running, but I'm at the crappy stage again because I hadn't run in a while. <laughs> get back to the better stage faster. Yeah, well, I had an injury too. Um, I was hiking in a previous relationship and I think that injury is my body saying, Hey, maybe you shouldn't be in the relationship. But it was, I thought it was a knee injury, but it ended up being like my IT band and a hip injury. I had a nurse for years. And so now like I only run like under two miles at a time, which is not that much for me at all. And I go slow. If you were my client, I would say, Get yeah. rid of the qualifying word. What do you mean I only run two no. miles at a time? Well, I, it's perfect for me because that's all I can do. And my no, body feels no. great and my joints don't hurt. I know, the problem is, is when you use words like yeah. only, your conscious mind is saying, mm. like, these are all really good things. I don't get injured. Your unconscious brain is saying, why are you so lazy? Like you wouldn't use the word only. Uh. Only is a qualifying word. So your conscious and your unconscious are saying very different things. And you're teaching yourself to be like, oh, I'm only doing, even though the fact that like consistency is so much more important than intensity that you do. Like it's much better to do a two mile run three days a week, two days a week versus like 10 mile run once a month and you get injured and you can't do anything for a year. So, so much of this is knowing what, like meeting yourself where you are, but the qualifying words, like, well, I should be like, you know, people say that all the time. Like they're saying a sentence that they don't mean is negative, but they use like shoulds or only. And then it's like, no, you're giving yourself, you're, you're flogging yourself unintentionally. Right? Oh yeah. Like, yeah. So anyway, you run two miles. Yes. At a time. I you run two miles at a time and, and I freaking great. I love it. And I <laughs> have to turn on either. I don't put music on anymore, which is like huge. Okay. And I just listen to my breath or whatever's going yeah, on. Meditation. Yeah. Or I will be jamming out. And I, sometimes I kind of sing while I run, like not oh, loud, wait, but wait, just wait. like, you know, getting into the groove. Um, my goal, we just got a dog in September and yeah. she's a year and a half old. Um, we haven't like been able to like do a full run together. Like she just gets, yeah. we're working on it. But my goal is like that future self, that that ideal self is like, Going for a nice trail run, no matter how long it is. I love trail running. Uh, yeah. With so. her and just like having her like on one of those. I see like these doggy mamas all the time with like those leashes yeah. around their waist. Yeah. We're not there yet. We'll be there. Oh We're working God. on yeah. it. <laughs> But, so we have a little quirky and I actually think that I'm not even saying we'll ever get there. Like that is like an aspirational goal. That <laughs> to happen. She's lovely. And she's such a runner when she's off the leash, but when she's on the leash, she just wants to herd you. So like, if I'm walking, yeah. with Jimmy, like she just like circles around us. And like, anyway, I don't think that her running beside me is ever a realistic goal. So that's fine. She will be, she's our like 
in the evening, relaxed walks together as a couple. Yeah. We take her and it's super cute. James takes her to the dog park a couple times during the day. Um, and I will just do my running separately from her. So that's like, that's not a realistic goal, but it's so, I think having dogs is just so lovely. It's really good for, there's this, this joke that went around the internet a couple months ago and where somebody went in to see the doctor and was like, I'm really depressed. I'd like some medication. And the doctor comes out with the dog and <laughs> was like, yes, that's so true. Yes. It's just like, there's something about looking in these little eyes that love you unconditionally. And there's so much energy and like the most crap can be going on in your life and you're just like oh yeah you're 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 just like pure or something it's, it's yeah. good. you have to get outside too oh yeah you know because he or she needs to be walked and I think that you know talking about like a system for motivation right like no matter how unmotivated you are if the dog needs to go out the dog needs to go out so that is a good system to have to sort of get yourself out of yourself and your stressors and just you mm-hmm. know help do something get out at least even if it's not an intense walk you're still getting out of the house fresh air you get some sunshine hopefully and that's so important for everything so yeah mm-hmm. I, think, I think having having those things that are like pull you out of yourself can be a really good thing yeah it, it makes you stand up to a bigger version of yourself you know that responsibility like that. something yeah. else something yeah. outside yourself and bigger version of yourself. I like that. Yeah. and i i want to circle it back to like you know i love what you say is it doesn't matter what works for others but what works for you and become your own fitness hero and I would love to hear, you know, how does one become, we can, we've touched on it, you know, we've danced around it. Um, how do you become your own fitness hero? Oh, I think you embrace that it's a long-term process. And if you just sort of think about that hero's sort of journey, and you think that there's going to be many calls to action in your life. And, you know, your doctor says you need to lose weight for your health. You try on a pair of jeans, you don't feel good. You go upstairs, you feel winded. Like all of those things are called to actions. And, you know, the hero gets called many, many times before he or she actually sort of sets forth on their trials. Um, And I think, I don't know, the idea of the hero's mindset in my brain is just that, it's like, as soon as you can make the journey a challenge, it becomes, you, you get more agency from it. I think the hardest thing with fitness is that so many times it's this external, like you should do this. And then it's almost this internal, like adolescent rebellion is like, don't tell me what to do. Like, I'm going to eat the food I want to eat. I'm going to eat the food like that, you know, makes me feel like I'm going to vomit after because I want to. Uh, And I think that with the hero's journey, it becomes something where you're like, oh yeah, like I actually want to eat well because I want to have the energy to do my workout tomorrow. Or I, you know, so just as soon as humans don't work well when agency is taken away from us. So as soon as it can become more of this intrinsic thing, um, you're going to be more likely to do it more often. Um, And, but I think in order to reach that hero's that feeling of being the sort of agent of your own change, you have to expect that it's not going to be a perfect journey. Like one of the things I love about the hero is that, you know, there's always so many trials that are thrown at at him or her. And it's, Every time you hit a, the trial, it's like it's a new opportunity to find solutions, to focus on the things that you can control, to, you know, that sphere of influence, sphere of control, and just sort of say like, okay, I'm going to be the person who finds a solution, not an excuse in this situation. And that by doing that, you then get more resilient, you get stronger, you get, you know, so I think, but I think a lot of people, they look at the health journey, it's like, well, I'll wait for the perfect day to work out or the perfect week. And I'll wait until everything is perfect. And it's like, there never is perfect. And whereas the hero knows that they know, you know, the hero hit around along their trials. It's like you hit lots of trials, but then they might meet, you know, they meet somebody who has wisdom and then they talk to that person and they learn something. So, you know, I think you look for people like the hero that you can get wisdom from look for people that you can learn from you know tony robbins often says that success leaves clues so where can you get some clues on how you could be successful and how can you when you meet an obstacle be like damn like this is challenging okay this is life throwing me an exam and i'm going to i'm going to work as hard as i can and learn as much as i can and if you do quote unquote fail you say there is no failure, like working is winning. So this is just really rich data, right? Like think about all the movies where the hero has failed a couple of times and then he or she has been like, okay, interesting. How am I going to beat that obstacle going forward? And then you have to work backwards and you have to create systems and you have to get stronger and you have to level up. And it's through the struggles that each hero does level up. And so if every time you meet a health struggle, you can think like, this isn't the end of me. This isn't the death of me. This is my opportunity to level up. And then it fills you with that, like, oh yeah, I'm powerful. I'm energized. Um, 
versus feeling like oppressed by the health and the fitness, right? It's not like, oh, I need to, or I should. It's, or it's not that the external world is like terrible and beating me down. It's like, yeah, I have this opportunity to figure out, like, maybe I didn't rise as well as I could this time, but what are the opportunities? How can I learn? And, you know, you're going to meet antagonistic forces. And sometimes those forces are actually just the voice in your head, right? Like they're the worst ones. So part of the hero's journey is learning how to deal with that internal voice. Uh, but maybe it's better. Like I'll give a couple examples. Like let's say you're the person who's like, today I'm going to eat perfectly, right? Now, first of all, there's no such thing as perfect, but whatever, you're going to eat better. And then at like three o'clock, you're like, eating the, the chocolate almonds and snacking. And you're like, oh man, I'm tell, I'm a loser. I always say I'm going to do well. And then I don't. And then, so that like, oh, I'm a loser and I'm falling off my horse. That's the, not the hero's answer, right? The hero's answer is like, interesting. Okay. So I was knocked off my horse. Why did I not have enough protein at lunch? Did I not have enough healthy fat at lunch? Was I too, like, I wasn't, I wasn't satisfied enough. So then I was reaching for sugar, right? Often you reach for sugar. If you haven't enough, had enough real nutritious food in your lunch, maybe you're reaching for sugar because your boss got mad at you and you were really stressed. Okay. So then maybe if you're stressed or you're angry, the answer is I go for a walk and I phone a friend and I work through that anger. Um, maybe you're caught getting sugar at three o'clock in the afternoon because you didn't go to bed the night before. So then you're drinking too much coffee and the coffee has sugar. And then, so if you can look at like what precedes that choice, then the choice is not something to have shame over. Like, yes, analyze it. Um, you want to, I, in my, on my website, I say like, you want to learn how to kick your ass with compassion. And so it's finding that balance. Like you acknowledge the behavior you're not proud of. The hero acknowledges like, yeah, I'm not proud of this. Like I want to do better, but you don't shame yourself about it, right? Like shame is about you as a human. So it's not like, oh, I had this chocolate. I'm a bad person. No, it's like, oh, I had this chocolate. How do I do better? What are the systems that I need to put in place? So the next time I meet that antagonistic force of this snacks at three o'clock in the afternoon, like what can I do better? And it might actually be that you can't have the snacks in your house, right? Like with COVID, a lot of us are just at home more. So the snacks, like my kitchen is like, well, I don't know what, 15 feet away. So I have just been really good, especially during COVID. I don't have food in the house that I would be tempted to eat at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, everybody, every hero has to figure out their own, what are their antagonistic forces? What are systems that they could put in place to help them with that fight and what are opportunities like what are growth opportunities um and what are people that they can call on for support like it it you know takes as i said earlier like my mom was my support system at the beginning i don't need her as much anymore i mean i love her and she's great that she's there but i don't need to call on her as, as much but i sure needed her 20 years ago and then i needed my therapist now james is great you know like if i say like oh i'm not going to do a workout he'll say like you always feel better when you move like just go do something and i'm like oh i know you're right then i do it and then i feel better so I don't know. Does that help at all? Explain the heroes? Oh, it so does. And I want to segue into, I know you are really, really pushing hard because we all need this, is finding your sanity during COVID. And I would love to start, I know you talk about mindset, nutrition, and workouts. I would. We've kind of touched on that mindset, but let, let's go through all three of those, um, maybe with mindset first and how, how that relates. Because I know you and I agree that this is an opportunity. This is an antagonist for the entire world. Yes. Who's going to show up? Who's going to rise up to the occasion? Yeah, I know. And I definitely, I say all of that knowing yeah. that I'm in such a privileged position. Like, Of I course, yes. My job online. And I'm so, so I say that with absolute awareness of, of my privilege. But I do think that one of the cool things about, like I read a lot of stoic philosophy and I love this idea of like, you know, you hit a fork in the road and there's always an option on that fork that will absolutely lead to like crappy Creek, right? Like, you know, if you eat an entire cake, that is crappy Creek. That's not going to make COVID better. That is not going to make your energy better. That is going to make you sleep badly. Right. But you also know that there's this opportunity to go to the right where at least you have the opportunity to get to beautiful health brook road, right? Like it doesn't necessarily mean that if you go for a walk, your day will 100% be better, but you're at least lining up the dominoes that hopefully it will make you healthier, make you happier, right? And so I like to think, okay, I'm at this sliding glass door moment, or um, I'm at this fork in the road. And like, what is the thing that I'm going to be able to go to bed tonight and say, like, I am proud of how I handled that moment, right? And listen, I fall off my horse. Um, you know, this interview was a great, great example of how I do my best. And I'm not always at my best. Like I was late for this interview because I put the time out wrong. And like, you know, like, so I, we all also have to have grace with ourselves. And like, we're only human and we can only do our best. 
but I think it's easy to, especially something like COVID to sort of think like to let our emotions get the best of us. And what I like to say to my clients is feel all your emotions. It's a crappy time. It's frustrating. We're all scared. Feel those emotions, but don't let the emotions dictate your behavior or as little as possible. Don't let them, right? So don't say I'm sad. Oh, I'm, I should eat a cake because the cake is not going to make you feel less sad. So if you're sad, what are things that are actually going to make you feel better? You know, can you get a therapist? Can you journal? Can you do some gratitude meditation, some loving kindness meditation? Can you phone a friend? Um, you know, can you have a bubble bath? And those things are actually going to be things that are going to help change your your physiological state. And then when your physiological state's better, you can create a better story in your head of what's going on. You can create a better strategy. Um, but, you know, you said about this idea of like the three, I call them the three mixes. So if you think about the nutrition mix, the, the workout mix and the mindset mix, think of it as like three legs of a table and the top of the table is sort of your overall health. And I think that the, the three pillars are really, really critical and they're all as equally as important because often with health and fitness, people throw out knowledge. So they're like, do these lunges, eat this food. Right, those are two pillars of the table. But if you don't have the mindset, to, to nudge yourself into making those correct decisions, you'll know all the knowledge in the world and you won't actually be able to follow through on the knowledge. So the mindset, the, mo the like meditation, the, you know, that growth mindset that Carl Dweck talks about, that is what actually allows you to have follow through on eating and exercising, right? So that's why all three of them are so important. Um, but like, if you're not eating well, you're not going to have the energy to to show up for yourself in a workout. If you're not eating well, if you're eating tons of sugar, you're not going to sleep very well. If you're not sleeping very well, your, your mindset is going to suffer. So it really is, they're all very, the three table legs are very, they feed in and out of each other. It's very omnidirectional. So I guess what I would throw at you is there, like, is there one of the table legs that you struggle with the most? Can you relate mm. to that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I see the interconnectedness of all of them. And I would like to add even like your poor diet affects your emotions and your mental oh health. God, absolutely. Like yeah. serotonin is. Yeah, exactly. I should yeah. have said, yeah, you're yeah. so right. So smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for me, I think, you know, working, working out this year has been the up and down thing for me. And it's just finding what... And I'm in the phase now where it's finding what works for me now, finding what works for me with a new puppy who likes to join in on anything I do in the house. And it's just for us, it's just getting outside and moving our body, whether it's, you know, we take her on two, at least two mile walks every day because she's a puppy. Yeah, she needs it. Exactly. She needs it. And go to the dog park and toss the ball. And yeah. she is a sprinter. When You know, I will say this, and I'm thinking about doing a blog post or a video on this topic because... You know, there's nothing I can do in the morning that's going to calm this dog down other than taking her for a walk. Well, first of all, feeding her, taking her aside to go potty, going for a walk. And then she is like a psycho at the park. She's zoned in on that tennis ball and for 20 minutes, back and forth, back and forth. But then after she gets that energy out, after she works out, we call them the zoomies, mm -hmm. you know, she's the sweetest most chill dog the rest of the day such a good lesson eh? we all need to be a puppy we need to just like go and run and get it out and yeah well and then yeah and then sleep really well and recover and yeah and that's a really good life lesson and get outside yeah maybe that should be the like title of the podcast <laughs> be a dog get outside get, dog. get your exercise sleep and eat yeah <laughs> you, your future self will thank you if you do those things but yeah. it's get no matter what you know no matter how cold it is or how rainy it is she needs we need to take her outside and that's exactly what we were talking about today it's like the non-negotiable you the non-negotiable yeah so funny like i i, I like and i know I'm, I'm joking about calling it about being a dog but in some ways there's an element of with our health we all have to learn how to give ourselves what we give the people that we love in our lives right yeah. like if you had a little kid you would never be like here's 700 million pounds of smarties and then like stay up all night and oh you got a bad math test oh well like who cares or you got a bad math test, you're like an idiot. Whereas like we do that to ourselves. It's like, you know, we don't eat the right, like the food that we were planning on eating and like, oh, you're stupid. And like, you should have known better. And like, we don't, we talk to ourselves in a terrible way, not in a way that we would talk to our kids. We don't give ourselves the respect that we give our dog. Like we say, well, it's non-negotiable. 
dog has to get outside. Well, it's not negotiable. We need to get outside. But for some reason, when it's us, like why, why is it negotiable when it's us? Like, what? like, so I don't know, there's something, there's something in this kernel of what we're talking about is that Mm -hmm. if we are able to prioritize these things for other people, like people are so good at taking care of their elderly parents and all this stuff. If there's time enough to do those things, then the it's a bullcrap excuse when we say, well, I don't have time. I don't, it's like, no, like you're just not prioritizing yourself. And it's not like, yeah, you might not have time to do an hour long workout, but do you have time to do five minutes of stretching? Absolutely. Do you have time to take, do 30 seconds of a meditation breath? Like the box breathing you did this morning, like that a minute of meditation breath will change your day. You know, um, this oh, yeah. meditation challenge that I'm doing with 10% happier, the meditations are eight to 10 minutes. Like it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. It's such a big deal though, right? Like it is a top domino or a linchpin habit or like whatever you want to call it. When you do those things, the rest of it kind of falls into place. So, oh yeah. Be a dog. Just, talk to yourself the way you talk to your kids. Talk, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I want for everybody. And, and it's also like for us, we have to... I don't want to say negotiate our needs, but we definitely, as a partnership, it's like, all right, I love walking with you in the morning, but today I need to meditate or today I need to do something else while you walk the dog and tomorrow we can flip. And so for us, it's really learning that flow. You know, we don't have a family other than a furry family, but it's like, I can see this opportunity teaching us the wisdom and those systems now because I can't imagine having a family and my heart goes out to all those mamas and papas out there. It's so hard right now. Yeah. But it's finding it where you can yeah. and yeah, having that support, support being, system. Yeah, support system and being able to say, like, I need this now and this yeah. is this is gonna make me a future self like healthier and happier and better able to come to the relationship and yeah, but again, what's tricky about that is you have to know what you need. And that's, oh, yeah. I think a lot of people, they don't, like that's, again, it took me 20 years of therapy for me to know, like, I need a 10 minute walk right now. You know, if I go for a 10 minute walk, I'm less likely to have a massive fight with you. You know, like, you know, with James, I'm talking about with my partner, like, <laughs> and it's, you know, I'll be like, you know, I'm just gonna go for a walk. And let's have a conversation with this later. Um, but like, it took me years of therapy to know that or years of therapy to know, like, that when he gives me a repair attempt, I will be healthier and happier if I just accept the repair attempt, you know, versus yep. staying angry for the sake of being angry. Um, so I don't know. I think, I, I think it honestly, it just all goes back to just having a little bit of compassion with yourself and all the people listening, just thinking like, this is, well, Susan David would call it um, a dead person's goal. The goal of like wanting to have no stress or no body pain or no anything like that. Right. So it's like, it's the problem of privilege of being alive. We get to figure this stuff out and it's a lovely privilege to, you know, to figure out what works and what doesn't. And, you know, if you can't speak up for yourself right now, like maybe you can, you know, a year, or maybe you speak up in little ways, or, you know, if you can't take an hour to exercise, maybe take two minutes and then that turns into three minutes and, it's just this beautiful evolution of knowing what you need and how you can ask for what you need and how you can negotiate and how you can, you know, drink a little bit more water, sleep a little bit more, you know, have a little bit more green veg, you know, it's just like slowly being like, okay, these things work, leave, take what works, leave what doesn't, gradually. Exactly. Moral of the whole story here. Exactly. <laughs> know yourself, leave what doesn't work and take what does. I think that, that that's, that's, yeah. that's a good encompassing the whole all right. Well, with that being said, because I looked down at the clock, was there anything else you wanted to wrap up or cover before we close the show out today? No, I just think I would say to everybody, like doing some research into the difference between shame and guilt is super critical. Mm-hmm. I think that people hear. Kathleen. Yes, Hello. When they hear so that just means letting myself off a lot of edging versus guilt and just the idea of um oh hi. Hi, right. you're you're glitching. I think you just froze again. Hello. There you go. Are we back? Hey. Yeah, we are back. So I, oh, if you want to re-answer it, I, I got to like researching the difference between shame and guilt. And then that's what, it, so you can say the whole thing over if you want. 
Um, I think I would just encourage everybody to do some research on the difference between shame and guilt. So Brené Brown talks a lot about that. And it's just this, you know, you can hold yourself accountable. By, guilt is connection to the action. Shame is connected to you as a human being. And guilt guilt can be useful, right? Like, I don't like this behavior. I, I wasn't proud of this. But shame is when you connect that behavior to you as a person. And that's so not helpful because if you feel like a crappy human, when you feel like a crappy human, you just want to make more crappy decisions because it's like you just go into that spiral of I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough. I might as well do this. I might as well skip more workouts. And it's just it's a really, really negative spiral. So, yeah. So I think that, that I would leave it with that because that's the way that you can sort of straddle that line between giving yourself the grace and the compassion that you need, but doing in a way that actually creates a future you that you're going to be proud of. Mm-hmm. Amen. Oh, I love a good Brene Brown read or podcast. She just amazing, yeah. oh, speaks to my soul. Um, <laughs> totally. <laughs> thank you, Kathleen, so very much. It oh, was my pleasure. I just loved it. What a wonderful conversation. Oh my goodness. Yes. And, you know, everybody who's a frequent listener knows this is how we close every single episode of just thanking you. We're so grateful for you not only showing up today with your wisdom and your knowledge and love for us, but for yourself, for your own hero's journey. And I, we, we always like to have this little call to action. How may we, the listeners, um, as an act of gratitude, be of service for you in return today? I think the next time you're out and about, because I think everybody in COVID really is missing sort of human interaction and human connection. So, I know we can't go up to people and I know we have to stay six feet apart, but you know what you can do? You can just smile with your eyes and give somebody a caring, compassionate look. Um, or if you can find a dog that you're allowed to pet and just like, you know, I just finding some ways to connect with the world in a really safe way. Send a text message to somebody that you care about. Send an email, have a Zoom call. Um, just tell some people in the way that you interact with them. I, you know, either friends, family, or just random people that you care and that you're thinking about them because we all, I think, really, really need that right now. Agreed. Agreed. What a lovely way to wrap up a beautiful episode. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Kathleen. My pleasure. Thank you. And remember, open up, surrender, trust, and let your body lead the way.